Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. This is what Christ wants for his church. He wants his church to be holy and blameless. Back in the olden days when Lynn and I were young and I had hair, back in the olden days we used to charge around the northeast of England on the most wonderful Triumph Bonneville. It was a 650 motorbike and it was just great fun. Great fun. A friend told us that there were a bunch of other Triumph owners that were going to be meeting one Thursday night in a pub in the village of, of, of Colourcoat, which overlooks the, the North Sea. They were thinking of setting up a Triumph Owners Club. Would we be interested in coming along? Well, you bet. Who, want, who wouldn't want to be a member of a Triumph Owners Club? A club where we could talk all night long about our passion for these wonderful motorbikes, but also there were guys there who were much more knowledgeable than I was so that I could ask them why my bike was making that funny noise. So we went along, and before long a, a, a committee was formed. Somebody volunteered to be the chairman, somebody else would be the secretary, somebody else was the treasurer. Lynn and I became club, club photographers, taking pictures such as this, that is me, taken by Lynn. So we were quick to organise runs out in the, North, the Northumberland hills, and, uh, and we go camping in Kielder Forest, generally having a whole load of fun mucking about on our motorbikes, they, which was wonderful when they worked. <laughs> Do you think this is the way a church is born? Do you think a church starts by somebody saying, I love singing hymns, and somebody else says, hey, so do I. And I like reading the Bible. Hey, so do I. Tell you what, let's form a church. You lead the singing, you be the treasurer, I'll do the speaking. Is that okay? Everybody got a job. Fantastic. Let's start a church. We better start looking for somewhere to meet. That's not the way a church starts. That's not the way a church starts. It might be fine for a motorbike club, but that's not the way a church is born. A church is not a human organisation. A church is a divine institution. <clears throat> it's a living thing ordained by God. The church, the Bible says that the church is the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. The church, it was the church that Christ died for and it's the church that Christ is coming back for. The Lord Jesus really loves his church. The Lord Jesus loves this church. Historically, this local church, Woodlands Church on Oakwood, it was, it's, we've been in, in existence for about 10 or 11 years. We were planted by Woodlands Evangelical Church on the Alistry Estate in Derby. And I'm immensely grateful to that church in Alistry for, for it, and to the members for their leadership, for their support, for their wisdom, for their encouragement, their love, and it must be said, for the money as well. They've been extremely generous to us. But now, it feels a little bit like, I don't know if, if how many have experienced this, but it feels a little bit like a, a child has returned from university, where the child has had a level of independence, and the parents have enjoyed having a quiet house, but then the, the child has, has finished that degree and they've come back home again, and it just feels like everybody's waiting for them to go off and establish their own home and stand on their own two feet. That's what we in, in Oakwood want, and that's what the church in Alistry want, because that's the natural progression of things. It's just not right if somebody my age is still living with their parents. That's not the way it's meant to be. Children are meant to, the, 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 one of the roles of parents is to bring the children up so that they can stand on their own feet. Well, that 
was the, the, the situation with this church plant. It was planted by the church in Alice Tree so that one day we'd be able to stand on our own two feet. And that, that was one of the, the, the tasks that, that, that I was given when I was uh, appointed here six months ago, lead the church to independence. So our official title is Christ's vision for his church. The subtitle is Christ's road for independence. So over the next couple of months, uh, through the autumn, we'll be preaching on various things uh, that we think would, we would need to have firmly in place for us to race towards independence. So this morning we're going to look at three questions. The first one will be, what is the church? We then look at what makes a church a church? And thirdly, we'll look at what is a church supposed to do? So the first one, what? What is? What is a church? The Bible was not written in English originally. The Bible, the New Testament was written originally in Greek and much of the uh, Old Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic. Now, the original Greek word for church is ecclesia, ecclesia. And that means, in English, that means called out. The, the original use would be in a Greek city like Athens or Sparta, where the town crier would, would go out into the town and he would call out everybody from their homes because they had an important announcement, maybe the king has died, long live the new king. Maybe our people have been in battle, and this is the result of the battle. We've either won or we've lost. But everybody come out and hear this news. This is important news. Everybody needs to get together. So this is what a church is. A church is a group of people who've been called out. We are called out to be holy, set apart for God. Now, in the New Testament, the, the word church is essentially used in two different ways. The first describes the universal church, which, mean, which means every church in every city, across every land, right throughout history. Not just restricted to our time, but the church throughout all generations across all lands. That's the church, and that's what I mean when I said earlier that it was the church that Christ died for and it's the church he's coming back for. All of those people who are part of the church through faith in Jesus across all of the world, across all of the generations. The other word for church means a, a local group of believers such as we have here. Now in the Bible, the Apostle Paul wrote to local churches in Rome, in Corinth, in Colossae, in Ephesus, that we just read from, and the church of Philippi. So there were local churches as well. Now I'm sure you know that there's only one head of the church. I know you'll be really glad to know it's not the pastor. The head of the church is Jesus Christ. Just as your physical body only has one head, so the church only has one head. And nothing should go on within the life of the church without it being under his headship. And nothing should be believed without it being directed by the head, by Jesus. How do we know what Jesus wants to happen within his church? How do you know what, what Jesus wants the church to believe? Well, he's, he's written it down for us in a book. He's written it down for us in a book. This is our root map. And me being a, a simple fella from North Shields has always been convinced that if you follow the map, you don't get lost. And this is why we put confidence in this book, the Bible, because it is a gift from a gracious God. So, that's what a church is. What makes a church a church? It's long been uh, thought that for a church to be a church, it has to do two main things. The first one it needs to do is to preach the Bible, which is what I'm doing right now. And the second would be that it would carry out two 
commands to ordinances given by Jesus, which would be baptism and sharing the Lord's Supper. So the, the first one of preaching the Bible, the Bible has to be central in the life of a church. And God said that the Bible should be explained through preaching. Again, which is what we're doing now. This book carries authority. So we absolutely must be under its authority. That's a good place to be. It's a good place to be under the authority of this book. Preaching must stay true to this book. It must reveal the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ alone. And we, we very confidently expect that lives will be changed as this book is taught. So that's one mark of a church. The second mark of the church is baptism and Lord's sharing of the Lord's Supper. Now, we, we are quite, sh quite confident what our understanding of baptism is. We, we, the, the elders here are quite confident that the, the Bible teaches baptism by full immersion. But that's not the point for today. The point is that baptism was taught by the Lord Jesus and it should be obeyed. The other thing is the Lord's Supper. The, the, the Bible tells us to share the Lord's Supper regularly. We, is, we are given the freedom as to how regularly we want to do that. Some, some churches do it every week. Some, some churches, like us, we, we do it once a month. That's, that's our choice. And we're, we're free to, to, to adapt and change that should we so want to. Why do we share the Lord's Supper? Because the Bible says that the cross where Jesus died is of central importance. The cross is of central importance, so that's why we share the Lord's Supper, to remember that Christ died not for anything bad that he done, but for the rubbish things that I do, for the way that we all mess up. So it's vital that we, we remember the cross of Jesus. So these are two essential things that, uh, by which a church is identified. And you'd be surprised to know that not every group meeting on a Sunday morning would carry out these two practices. Let me give you a few more, though. These are the main ones that a church has to do. Let me give you a few more. A, a fellow called Wayne Grudem wrote a massive book of, of systematic theology and he gave an additional list of things that would be uh, that helpful for a church to practice. So, preaching the Bible, we've said that. Proper administration of baptism and Lord's Supper, we've said that. Church leadership and structure. It's important that, that, uh, that we have proper, uh, proper leaders within a church and a theology degree does not give somebody the right to be in church leadership. There are instructions in the Bible for leadership and they are the ones that we follow. A theology degree would be of immense value to, to all of us. I encourage all of you to study a theology degree, but that's not the qualification for leadership. The qualification is what the Bible says. Most of it talks about how, how you, you live your life out at home. Not, not about head knowledge. So we need biblical leadership. We need a, a good effective structure. We need the right use of discipline. There are times when the elders are going to have to, to go to somebody's house, knock on the door and say, look, what, what you're doing isn't right according to the Bible. So you need to really think about changing what you're doing with n not to slap them on the wrist, but to, to, to bring them lovingly back under the authority of the Bible. So the times when, uh, when church discipline must be carried out, always with the, always gently and lovingly with the, the, the idea of bringing people back to biblical living. There should be genuine worship, not singing songs, but genuine worship in spirit and in truth. There should be effective prayer. There should be effective witness. There should be effective fellowship. There should be spiritual power in ministry. There should be personal holiness of life amongst its members. There should be the care for the poor. The Bible speaks lots about that. And central is love of the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us enough to die in our place.
So all of these things will go a long way to making a church more called out, more called out from society, set apart to be like Jesus. That's the point, to be like Jesus. So what is my third point? What is a church supposed to do? A church will be engaged in many, many ministries, but its three main things must be the worship of God, the minister to its people, and to minister to the world. I sometimes call these three things, where are we? Up, in, and out. I sometimes call these three things the worship of God, the minister, looking after each other and ministering to the world. I call these up, in and out. The focus of our hearts must definitely be up to God, in towards each other, loving each other and encouraging one another and taking the good news of Jesus out to a world that doesn't know him. So the first one, worship God in in the New Testament, in Colossians chapter 3, it says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do you see that we're called to, to worship God through the teaching of the Bible and with grateful hearts in song and in word and in deed. God, in his kindness, knows that the best place in the whole universe for us is at his feet looking up to seeing how great he is. That's, that's the best place for you. The best place for us is worshipping God. And so we are to do this regularly. The worship of God may include singing, but it's not exclusively singing. To worship somebody actually means to bow down before them and kiss their hand. You, you, if, if you picture back in the Middle Ages of, 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 of a knight in shining armour, and coming before his king and kissing the king's hand, that is what worship really means. And what, what a knight does when he king, kisses the king's hand is saying, my life is in your hands. That, that's what we have to do with God. We have to worship him by bowing before him, metaphorically kissing his hand and saying, my life is in your hands. That's what worship is. The other thing that we're meant to do is to minister to one another. It's an essential thing to, to minister to one another, to encourage one another, to love one another deeply from the heart, it says in the Bible. Long before this earth was ever created, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit lived in beautiful, perfect harmony and unity and joy. And since we are made in the image of God, then that's one of the characteristics that God put in our heart. Relationship. God put relationship in our heart. So if you're a Christian, you belong to God because he's bought you with the precious blood of Jesus. And he's very deliberately put you in a, a community of other believers. Being in Christ means being with other people who are also in Christ. And the Bible word for that is, the Greek word is koinonia. Koinonia, does anybody know what that word koinonia means? Fellowship, excellent. The word... what, a, what a great teacher who gives you the answers and you give him the right answer and I say, well done. Excellent. The word koinonia means fellowship. Good. The trouble is, Nowadays, that, that word fellowship has, has become distorted, where we think at the end of a service when we're sipping tea and dunking rich tea biscuits together and chatting, we think that's fellowship. It's not. It's not. That's drinking tea and eating biscuits and chatting. 
You're going to do that at work tomorrow. It's not the same thing. A better translation of the word koinonia would be community. Community with strong links together. In, in the New Testament, <coughs> excuse me, in the New Testament, we find that the, the early church, within days of coming to faith in Jesus, the early church were sharing their lives together and sharing their food and their property as they lived in community together. It tells us in the book of Acts, all believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who was in need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. You know, this wasn't some kind of hippie commune. This is people who lived to, in their own homes and sometimes sold those homes if somebody was in, in desperate need. But they lived in their own homes, but they met together regularly and they loved one another. And you know what? They showed that love to one another in practical ways. That's what a Christian community should be doing. it, And that's the pattern that we want to establish at this local church in Oakwood. A strong community together. Because you know what? Community draws people like a moth to a flame. It really does. One of my favourite analogies of the church is found in uh, a letter written by Peter. Peter was one of Jesus' main disciples. And he wrote... In his first letter, because he wrote two, in his first letter in chapter two, Peter writes, as you come to him, that's Jesus, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also are like living stones, being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Peter says that Jesus is the living stone. He's also the living bread. He's the living water, the living word. He's the one from whom life springs. And he's come to give us life and life to the full. Peter says that if Jesus is a living stone, then we, if you're a Christian, then you are meant to be a living stone as well. Joined together. Now, a brick by itself. It's sad to say that a, the, the grow, a growing group of Christians is those who are not part of a church anymore. I know a number of Christians who just don't go to church. I think the expression is, I still like God, but I'm not keen on his fan club. It's very, very sad. Some, a, Chris, a believer in Jesus who's not part of a church, you remember Living Stones? It's, it's, it's just a brick on the ground. It's just a stone on the ground. And a stone on the ground is no use, no use to anyone. No use to itself. It's, not, it's not, not doing anything, is it? That's not why a brick was made. Just to be chucked away on the ground somewhere. Peter says that we are... What's the, the proper use of a brick? To be in a wall. That's what a brick's for, isn't it? To be part of a wall. So I, I, I love this picture of a, of a church. This is what a church is meant to be. If that's you, the middle brick there, the most of the time you're rubbing shoulders with other people in the church. And that's fine, isn't it? Eh? But sometimes the wheels are going to fall off your wagon and... It may, it may be illness, it may be unemployment, it, it may be trouble with your neighbours, it, it, it could be an inability to pay the gas bill. There are times when you're going to need the support of other people. You're going to need the support of other believers. So that the church is meant to do that. The church is meant to support one another when we go through a difficult time. And in the fullness of time... There are times when other people will be going through a difficult time. So what do you do? Well, you support them. And the truth is, 
that all of these things may ha be happening at the same time. You'll be rubbing shoulders with some, you'll be supporting others who are going through a hard time, whilst at the same time you are going through a difficult period. That's one of the beautiful things about a church. A stone is strategically placed in the wall, rubbing shoulders with one another, supporting one another, and also supporting each other when we, when we need it. Do you know what the loudest sound in a church is? Do you, particularly a small church like ours, do you know what the loudest sound in a church is? An empty seat. An empty seat is the loudest sound in a small church because it screams out that that person who always sits there is missing. Now obviously we all need holidays. Obviously we all need to go away and visit family who live in different parts of the country. We all get sick. So there are times when, times when all of us are going to be away and that's okay. But if we choose to miss because you fancy to lie in, or if we choose to miss because you fancy going for a picnic because the sun's shining, then there's a gap in the wall. And when there's a gap in the wall, the wind whistles through and everybody's cold. So it's really important that if, if you're a part of the local church, it's really important that you, that you play an active part in that church, okay? So the third thing that we're meant to do is to minister to the world. The third activity of, the, of, of a church must be telling people that, that there is good news, that there is a God in heaven, whether you like it or not. And he sent his son 2,000 years ago to die on a cross, specifically to die on the cross so that the relationship between us and God could be restored again. Now, the church is meant to broadcast this news. It, it, it might mean telling people on the other side of the world about Jesus. It might be telling people next door to you or on the desk next to you at work about Jesus. One of the very, very last things that Jesus said before he went back to heaven is in Matthew 28. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now, because all authority has been given to Jesus, therefore you are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And we do this because Jesus has been given all power and authority. That, that, that's exciting. So that it's not, we're not dependent on weak, little, inefficient me and you. It's, 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 it's powered along by Jesus, who's been given all power and authority. And that changes everything, doesn't it? That gives us great confidence, because it's, it's not, a, not about us, it's about him and what he's able to do. So a local church should be engaged in, in gospel activity locally and internationally as well. Telling the people that there's a God in heaven and that one day they're going to have to bow down before him. And the heart of the church is to bring people to Jesus. To bring people to Jesus Christ, him who died on the cross so that they may be saved. This is, Jesus is a wonderful saviour. I've been following Jesus for 30 years and never once regretted it. Never once regretted following Jesus for 30 years because he loves me so much that he died for me. You know what? He loves you as well. He loves you so much that he died for you. He's a wonderful saviour. He loves us. So, I want you to remember, folks, church is not somewhere we go. It's a it's bad grammar to say to somebody, I'll see you at the church on Sunday. Church is not somewhere we go. Church is somewhere where we are. Church is, church is the local family of God to whom I am committed through faith in Jesus Christ. 
Okay? Church is a group of believers that I'm committed to through, through our, our collective faith in Christ. A, a massively important statement about being part of a church is it's not about me. It's not about me. Church isn't about me. Church isn't about where we, we get the, where we sing the songs that I like and we don't sing the songs that I don't like. It's not about sitting in a, a room that I like. It's not about the, the structure of the service that I personally like. I, I have to say, folks, as, as, the, as the pastor here, there, there are things that within the, the life of this church I don't like, but it's not about me. It's not about me. I'm not, I'm not structuring the church to get it perfectly the way that I want to. Who am I? Huh. No, church is not about me and it's not about you. Church is not about my likes and my dislikes and my preferred way of doing things. Church is about Jesus. Church is about Jesus. It's about Jesus Christ. Him who loved the church so much and gave himself for her. Do you think churches, do you think that sentence makes sense? If you think of church as a building? Do you think church is... is, is, is it, Church is a building, you know, there, there's the steeple and there's the people. And did, did, did Jesus died for a building with a steeple? Well, that, that's nonsense, isn't it? But Jesus died for the people who make up the church. Jesus died for the people who made up the church. And he died for you, whether you're part of the church or not. The church, let me tell you folks, the church is the centre of what God is doing in this world today. So that together, the army of God will march out and we will worship him and we will love one another and we'll spread the good news of Jesus Christ. I think that's exciting. I think that that means the church has got a great future because it's safe in his hands. Amen.